It's time, 10.01. Yep, yep, we're good. Thank you, Ash. Well, good morning. My name is Horace Hodge, and I will serve as the moderator for today's session. I'm the USDA liaison with the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement, serving at Prairie View A&M University. On behalf of my colleague, Ruben De La Garza, USDA liaison serving at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and I, we thank you for joining us for the second day of the inaugural USDA Office of Partnership and Public Engagement, Texas Youth Summit. We'd also like to have now, uh, before we get started, just a few reminders. And if we could go ahead and change the slide there. Uh, <clears throat> we wanna remind you to keep all microphones muted uh, unless you're speaking. Question for the presenters may be entered into the chat box. And if you registered or did not register, we want you to include your email so that we can get the answers for you in case we're not able to answer them to, during the session. A recording of this webinar will be emailed to all registered participants after the event. And I again remind you that if you did not register and would like to receive a card, and make sure you put your email in the chat box. Thank you. I want to take a minute to recognize the planning committee. Uh, they've done an awesome job and we had great participation uh, as you saw yesterday and as you will see today. We have Joshua Coleman, USDA Farm Service Agency, Renan Carbonero, Idea Public Schools, Dr. Raquel Drawhood, Prairie View A&M University, Jasmine Hernandez, Workforce Solution, Dr. Courtney Hollinsworth, USDA OPPE, Jacqueline Sanders, Prairie View A&M University, Dr. Carolyn Williams, Prairie View A&M University, and Brian Zucco, USDA Office of Partnership and Public Engagement. We have a tight schedule this morning, uh, maybe more I should say an aggressive schedule this morning. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Courtney Hollinsworth. Dr. Courtney Hollinsworth serves as the Youth Coordinator with the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement, Washington, DC. She completed a specialist in higher education administration and a doctorate of philosophy in advanced statistical analysis and technology education at William Carey University while also completing her specialist in diversity and inclusion from Mississippi State University. She holds other degrees, including a bachelor's degree from Mississippi State University, an MBA from William Carey University. Dr. Hollingworth has worked on Capitol Hill, the White House, the US Department of Justice, Armstrong Williams Office, the Johnny Cochran Firm, and numerous others. She is the co-founder of Transition, a nonprofit that helps prepare youth and youth, young adults ages 12 to 25 for future careers. She has trained youth at the University of Tennessee, Native American Teens Preparation Group, Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated, National STEMS Program, National Girls State, Saving Sisters, and Jamaican Academy. Dr. Hollingworth has received numerous honors and awards, including the U.S. Presidential Service Award, United States Thomas Jefferson Award, and Mississippi Top 40 Under 40. However, her health is her greatest accomplishment. Please welcome Dr. Courtney Hollinsworth. Take it away, Dr. Hollinsworth. Thank you very much and for the warm welcome, I'm Horace. Good morning and welcome to day two of the Texas Youth Summit. I'm extremely elated to see each of you here today. Today, you will have a door open for you to learn about life altering careers and have the opportunity to get involved in advancing your future. My favorite quote is, politics, life, and business are not spectator sports. You have to get involved to get ahead. Most importantly, when you reach that level of success, leave the ladder down and the door open for others to follow. A career in agriculture allows you every day to leave the ladder down for others to follow. Agriculture is one of the most important fields in the world. I challenge you to do something today without touching or doing anything that deals with agriculture. The truth is, it's impossible. Today, I'm wearing a necklace that has a moon and a star on it. My parents have always told me, reach for the moon, and if you fall short, you will always be amongst the stars. 
Today, I hope you get your fuel from the careers today that discuss agriculture, that tell you about how you get your food, your fuel from food, which is also produced through agriculture. I hope you get your rocket from learning about grants, loans, and scholarships that can help advance your career and grow your future. I hope you get your map to guide you from the Ag Lab that will lay out an outline for the futures in careers in ag. Finally, and most importantly, I hope you get your rocket boosters from your passion and desires for you to make a difference. Because agriculture has so many different career opportunities in the field, you will always be amongst the stars. I thank you very much for coming today. And I thank you for taking time to advance your career. And I hope you enjoy this second day of this youth summit. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Hollinsworth, and congratulations on your many, many accomplishments. Next, it's always a pleasure to hear our students' stories. However, um, our students this morning uh, had power failure and could not be with us. However, I did want to just introduce you to him because he has a story. Isaiah Hadamelo is currently a graduate student at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley pursuing a Master of Science in Agricultural Environmental Sustainability Sciences. He received a BS of Science from UTRGV, and as an undergraduate student, he was part of USDA grant-funded project entitled Training, Research, and Education in Soil Science. The project helped prepare students for soil science careers with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Isaiah has accepted a position as a soil conservationist and will start next month in Arizona. We just wanna say congratulations, Isaiah, and we wish you the very, very best in your career path. Agriculture affects everyone's life every day in every way. Today, you will learn about the different careers in agriculture. You will also learn that people with careers in agriculture are making a difference every day to ensure that our food supply is adequate, it's safe, it's affordable, and it's healthy. Our speaker will discuss their careers and how they happen to be where they are and that you can find a fulfilling career in agriculture even if you choose a course of study outside of the field. I will now introduce our next speaker. Tori Powell currently serves as the National Outreach Coordinator for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Marketing Service and performs evaluation and branch in the performance evaluation branch. Prior to this, Tori serves as the National Coordinator for the Agriculture Youth Program for USDA, Office of the Secretary, where he led a departmental-wide effort to support an inclusive, prosperous, intergenerational agricultural workforce. Tori is a disabled veteran of the United States Army, including a 2010 deployment to Kandahar, Afghanistan. His distinguished service concluded in 2016 with multiple commendations. Tori received a BS of Arts degree in Marketing and Communications from Concordia University, Texas in Austin, and a Master of Social Work degree with a specialization in policy from the University of Houston Graduates College of Social Work and an Executive Master of Public Service and Administration degree from Texas A&M University Bush School of Government and Public Service in 2020. Tori, it's your time. Thank you, Horace, and thank you, Courtney, Dr. Hollingsworth for that uh, wonderful welcome. Um, let me just start by saying thank you to Horace, Ruby, and the entire planning committee who's put on this amazing youth summit uh, and providing an opportunity for today's speakers to share their journeys. Uh, my name is Tori Powell, um, and I currently serve as the National Outreach Coordinator for the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service. I always like to start these conversations by sharing that uh, my journey into ag was is somewhat of an accident. Um, before joining USDA, I had no idea uh, what USDA did. I had no idea um, all the programs and resources that USDA offer. Um, I was one of those people that thought USDA stamped meat um, or administered food stamps. Um, but I can say now that after spending six years working with the amazing public servants, many of whom are on this call, 
um, that I wouldn't have it any other way and I wouldn't, can't imagine working anywhere else. Uh, my journey to USDA started in Texas um, after returning back from uh, deployment to Afghanistan. Um, I knew that I wanted to give back. I knew that my vocation was calling me to help others. Um, so I decided to pursue a, a Master of Social Work degree with an uh, intention of going to work for the VA. Excuse me, Tori. Um, Excuse me. Yes. I think your voice is cracking. Uh, maybe the connection is loose or something. Uh, can you just, uh, you know, make sure that your connection to the computer is tight or just remove yeah, it back? Give me one second. Okay, go ahead and check. Okay, it's mute right now, so I'll just unmute it. All right, is that better? Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, yes. yes, much better. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure Thank how you. much you heard, um, but I was just, it was just talking about, you know, my journey into ag, um, and it started, uh, my journey into USDA started uh, in Texas. Um, after returning back from Afghanistan, uh, deployment to Afghanistan, I felt called to help others um, and to give back. Um, so I went to school to pursue a master's in social work degree um, with the you know, intention of going on to work at the VA. Um, unfortunately, uh, coming to terms with my own PTSD, um, that was off the table. That got taken off the table for me. Um, but fortunately, my university really taught me um, and opened up the world of policy and program evaluation. Um, and I fell in love with the um, an understanding of how programs and policies impact the day-to-day the -day lives of everyday people. After graduating from the University of Houston, I was selected as a presidential management fellow uh, with the US Forest Service and with the first duty station in Anchorage, Alaska. So after convincing uh, my wife to move up to Anchorage, Alaska from Houston, um, reluctantly so, um, I began my journey uh, with USDA. Um, my first role with USDA was a partnership and community outreach coordinator. Um, with one of my main focus areas was leading a program called the Chugach Children's Forest, which was an effort um, really focused on providing life-changing wilderness experiences to uh, Alaskan youth, really with the main intent and um, goal of developing the next generation of environmental stewards and environmental leaders. Um, many program participants have gone on to play important roles in the climate change and environmental justice arenas, including serving as um, Arctic Youth Ambassadors and participants to the, the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, one of the key components of the Presidential Management Fellowship is the opportunity to do a four to six month rotational uh, and developmental assignment within the federal government. Um, so uh, I took a fellowship uh, developmental assignment to uh, Washington, DC. So from Anchorage to DC um, to serve as the urban engagement coordinator for US Forest Service um, program called Every Kid in a Park, which really focused on um, introducing nature and introducing um, uh, the forests and parks to, to young people um, starting at the age of four. Um, uh, and really focusing, my role was really focused on, centered on um, how do we engage and um, break down barriers for those youth that are serving, um, that live in urban areas. After this developmental assignment was complete, um, I made a decision to stay in DC. Um, I utilized my network to find opportunities to lead outreach for the USDA Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Um, this role was focused on developing partnerships and with faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, um, and ensuring they had equitable access to USDA programs and resources. After serving in that position for three years, I had the opportunity to serve as the first uh, ever agricultural youth organization coordinator. Uh, authorized by the 2018 FAR bill, this opportunity is really focused on developing partnerships that supported um, inclusive and inter intergenerational agricultural work workforce. Um, and last August, uh, I transitioned to the Agricultural Marketing Service, where I lead outreach with a particular focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and directing the work on COVID response and recovery efforts. Um, so that's my journey uh, and where I'm at now. Um, and I was asked to share a few kind of lessons learned along the way. And um, a few of those that popped to mind are 
being flexible to and open to opportunities. Um, I wouldn't be where I am now if um, I wasn't open and uh, to the various opportunities that USDA provided. I've had the opportunity to work on some amazing projects and programs from leading the 2015 Capital Christmas Tree Campaign to providing more than 100 um, jobs and career opportunities for, for young people. Um, and this was all because I was open um, to new and exciting opportunities. I was willing to travel um, and I was willing to, to leave that door open. The second, second piece I'll leave with is um, uh, developing a trusted network of colleagues and mentors. I wouldn't be where I am today without the mentorship and the, uh, the collegial uh, conversations that I've had with some of the people on this call who have helped guide and shape and um, keep the door open for opportunities for myself and others. Um, and lastly, let me say that USDA is one of the few federal agencies that has, ha uh, has an impact on the day-to-day -day lives of everyday individuals. And I've been fortunate enough to experience the direct impact of our work. I get to see it every day. I get the phone calls and I get to hear all the amazing stories of these life-changing um, programs and services from the Farmers to Family Food Boxes to um, the agricultural programs um, that are, are um, providing income to a rural workforce. Um, so I get to see that every day and, and I'm immensely grateful for the opportunity to serve at USDA. My story is one of many unique career paths that you'll hear today. And I'm just fortunate enough to be among um, one of them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tori. Uh, a great story, a uh, great journey. And, and most of all, we wanna say uh, thank you for your, um, your service. Appreciate that. And thank you. Now um, we will hear from Michaela Carter. Michaela Carter was named Deputy Director of Communication in the Office of Communication. Most recently, Carter served as Director of Communication and External Affairs for the House Agriculture Committee, where she worked for Chairman David Scott. Previous to that, she served as an Outreach Coordinator for the Committee under Chairman Colin Peterson. And prior to that, Carter served as the Communication Director and Senior Legislative Assistant to Congressman Philemon Bela of Texas. She grew up in DeSoto, Texas and holds a Bachelor's in Agriculture Leadership and Development from Texas A&M University. Take it away, Michaela. Thank you so much, Horace. And thank you um, to you and Ruby for having me here today. It's so exciting to do anything Texas related and I will always say yes. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, so just going off of my bio, as Horace mentioned, um, I grew up in DeSoto, Texas and decided that I wanted to go to Texas A&M mostly because I really liked the logo. <laughs> and then I had the opportunity to visit and love the campus. Um, and when I went to Texas A&M, I started out as a biochemistry major, pre-med, and after a year of doing that, decided that it wasn't right for me. Um, and so I had a, an advisor tell me about the agricultural leadership and development program at Texas A&M. And I had no idea <laughs> what I was gonna do following that. But once I started the major, I loved it. And you know, when I graduated with that degree and a minor in concentration and communications, a lot of folks asked me, well, what are you gonna do with that? And now I get to tell them I'm using my degree quite literally <laughs> in my everyday duties. Um, next week will actually make three months of me being in this role with USDA. Um, but I've had the opportunity to work on so many meaningful things that the short time feels much longer. Um, so once I graduated from Texas A&M, a professor and mentor, Dr. Alvin Lark, um, suggested that I apply to the Texas A&M Agricultural and Natural Resources Policy Internship Program, um, but only if I promise to move back to Texas right after. I've been in DC for almost eight years, so that did not happen, but I did go through the internship. And during the internship, I was placed in the office of um, Congressman Philemon Bella from South Texas. Um, starting out, that internship was during the 2013 Farm Bill. And I had no background in policy, even though I had an understanding of ag. And because I was an intern during that critical time, and he was also a freshman member at the time, so he didn't have 
a full-time ag staffer in his office, he had a shared staffer. So I have the opportunity to kind of leverage that and, and use that to learn and to grow and to be that in-person, um, in-office representative for the Farm Bill. So I learned so much about ag policy, um, more than I thought I would ever learn <laughs> in my lifetime. But it really set the standard for how I moved about um, going forward. So I stayed with Congressman Vela for almost six years. And during that time, I had the opportunity to work on also the 2018 Farm Bill. And there are so many issues in Texas um, that are related to agriculture. So I would travel down to South Texas and visit farmers, visit ranchers, you know, talk with folks who benefited from programs at USDA. And I worked a lot with um, folks from USDA, probably bothered them a little more <laughs> than, than they wanted to, but they were always extremely helpful and um, extremely gracious in, in giving information. Um, and so as I was doing that, I was also doing um, other policy issues related to education, related to veterans issues. And at the top of me handling all those issues, I was offered the position of communications director. And I told the Congressman that I would take on that position only if he would allow me to maintain my agriculture policy portfolio because I really just love the work. I love the folks that I got to work with and, you know, I did it to myself doing double duty, but it was certainly worth it and certainly worth it to um, continue building that network in the agriculture space. Um, following my time with Congressman Vela, I went over to the House Agriculture Committee, um, which was under the leadership of Congressman Colin Peterson at the time. And I had the opportunity to work on outreach. And so I worked mostly with stakeholder groups or even universities um, to ensure that they were aware of the work that the committee was doing and that we also were aware of what they were doing so that we could ensure that uh, we were collaborating and um, getting across the best messaging for folks. And once Chairman David Scott, who was the first black chairman to chair the committee in its 200 year history um, came in, I had the opportunity to step in as the communications director and also continue handling external affairs. Um, and that was for a short amount of time because shortly after that, I was offered um, the deputy director role here at USDA in the Office of Communications. And in that role, because they wanted me to talk a little bit about what I do. So each day is different, but um, for me, that's exciting. It means that I can, you know, work on different things, can give opinions on different things, but I spend most days working with different team members throughout USDA, other agencies, and sometimes even the White House to figure out how we can best get information to the people that we serve. Um, and because I am an appointee, one of the things that we do is ensure that um, the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration are reflected in the work that we're doing and we get to work alongside the wonderful the wonderful career staff to ensure that that's happening. Um, some of those priorities have included getting meals to students who are in school, um, encouraging folks to get vaccinated and providing resources for folks in rural America to get those COVID tests and vaccines, um, setting up programs to support farmers and um, one other big project that we've been working on is making the agriculture sector more equitable among many other things. Um, some of my other duties include preparing memos, talking speeches, talking points, excuse me, or speeches for the secretary um, and other senior officials within the department, approving quotes or statements, and overall just working with our amazing team to ensure that we're getting all of the information out. USDA offers so many wonderful programs, um, so many wonderful grant opportunities, loan opportunities, and we want to ensure that each person that's eligible knows about all of the benefits that USDA has to offer. Um, Ruby also asked me to share the coolest thing that I've done thus far, 
And I think outside of just being able to to be a background messenger of you know the amazing things that we're doing to put food on the table for folks to you know get debt relief to folks um one of my personal coolest things that's happened thus far is i was able to provide edits to the national agriculture day proclamation that went out um a few months ago i think it was in march and some of those edits were included in the final version of the proclamation that was issued by the president so um, I had a full fangirl moment, <laughs> and I think I may print it out and hang it up somewhere. Um, but overall, I think just this journey to USDA and being here, um, I've known about USDA for, for years, and being here has really given me the glimpse into the wonderful work that's being done. And um, I know that there's even greater work to come. So I encourage any folks who are interested in working at USDA to please move forward. And um, if I can ever be a resource, please always feel free to reach out. Thank you all for having me. Awesome, awesome, awesome journey. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, a lot of uh, powerful uh, uh, communications, if you will, that takes place. And you're representing uh, Texas uh, very well. I was hoping to be able to tell you that I was gonna have the Soda High School on, but I think maybe they are in testing, but we will make sure that they know a native uh, DeSotian is, um, is in high places and we will make sure that they get a copy of this recording. Thank you so much, uh, Michaela. <clears throat> Moving to our next presenter. Uh, this guy is a pollinator ecologist. I, I, wanna, I would really wanna find out what that is and, and hear his presentation. Dr. Ray Morass is the grazing land pollinator ecologist for Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Ray also serves as the partner biologist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service and assists in the Central National Technology Support Center with pollinator conservation. Ray lives and works in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Take it away, Ray. Thank you very much, Horace. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Well, the title of my talk is Working to Save the Planet by Saving the Insects That Run It. So I'm a bug guy. I love bugs and plants. Next slide, please. And my titles, as Horace mentioned, are that I'm a pollinator ecologist and a conservationist. So an ecologist means I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, and I study plants and insects, especially pollinating insects. But I'm also a conservationist, which means I help save nature. I help save the world, help make the world a better place. And so the photo of me on the right is me with my conservationist hat on. The photos on the left are me being a scientist. Next slide, please. So the Xerces Society for, Conser for Invertebrate Conservation, they actually pay my salary. They're a nonprofit organization that helps to save invertebrates. What are invertebrates? Animals without backbones. All the little creatures, um, bees, butterflies, and other insects, but also spiders, crayfish, lobsters, snails, things like that. Those are invertebrate animals and we work to save them. Next slide, please. The Xerces Society, the people pay my, who pay my salary, pay me to help the USDA. The USDA doesn't have jobs for people focusing on pollinators at this point, but they hire contractors like me who have pollinator expertise to help them achieve their mission of working with farmers and ranchers and forest owners to protect natural resources and feed the world. Next slide, please. So what are the insect pollinators? Uh, well, here are six main groups. On the upper left, of course, you've got a butterfly. To the right of that, you've got what looks like a bee, but it's not, it's a fly. To the right of that is a moth. Moths are good pollinators. Down on the lower uh, row, we've got wasps on the left, beetles in the middle, and that thing on the right, the lower right, that looks like a bee, it really is a bee. And bees are our best pollinators. 
Next slide, please. So why are pollinators important? Well, they pollinate most of the flowers on the planet. More than 85% of flowering plants uh, on our planet require animals, usually insects, to carry pollen from flower to another. And that's how they reproduce. That's how they make seeds. Next slide, please. So they're really important to us, pollinators are, and to the USDA, because they help with so many of our tastiest crops, like fruits and vegetables. And of course, lots of the vitamins and minerals we need for our bodies to stay healthy come from plants pollinated by insects. And the value, economic value of this is uh, billions of dollars. Next slide, please. So what do I do to help pollinators? I do research. That shows me doing some research on a monarch butterfly. Uh, next slide. I do research in Oklahoma prairies on butterflies and plants. Sometimes I run into one bison, like this one here. Next slide. Sometimes I'm working with a whole herd of bison, including that little baby bison up near the front. Next slide. Another thing I do to help pollinators is to create documents that teach people about pollinators and how to improve habitat for them. And that's on the left is a document that I helped with and that photo of the butterfly I took in my backyard a few years ago. So I'm, I'm proud of my work on that doc. Next slide. As part of my work, I light prairies on fire. Uh, yes, it's a little dangerous. Uh, yes, it's extremely fun. So the photo on the left is me doing a fire in Iowa. The photo on the right is a photo I took while uh, of a fire I had just lit in Oklahoma. Yes, I get paid to do this. Next slide. Next slide, please. Why do we, oh, why do we do this? To kill cedars that are taking over our grasslands. The Native Americans did burns like this for thousands of years, and they knew that it helped improve forage for bison, and now we do it to improve forage for cattle. Next slide. We also do it because research that I helped do years ago uh, has demonstrated that fire increases the number of flowers in our grasslands. And if we have more flowers, we have more food for the pollinators. Next slide. My funnest week of work was uh, when the USDA sent me down to central Mexico to see the monarch butterflies. And this is a picture of the mountains of central Mexico. Next slide. My single favorite place in the world is the Sanctuario de la Mariposa Monarca, El Rosario in central Mexico. Um, this place is awesome. Next slide. And while I was there, I saw millions and millions of monarch butterflies because the monarch butterflies from the United States that migrate through Texas in the fall, they all go to this one small area in Mexico and I saw millions and millions of them. Next slide. And I walked the trails with three of the world's greatest experts, including uh, all, all friends of mine, the fellow on the left I've known for almost 30 years. I was in his wedding in uh, Kerrville, Texas, many years ago, Dr. Alfonso Alonso, the world's expert on these, on these monarch colonies down in Mexico, a wonderful guy. Next slide, please. My work, my work affects people. When I help pollinators, that increases crop yields and thus keeps people well-fed and healthy. When I help pollinators, that helps the wildflowers do better. And by increasing the number of wildflowers and pollinators, I help make the world a more beautiful place. Next slide, please. I also work to train the next generation. So I've taught my daughter, who's uh, just turned 18, how to light our grass on fire. Uh, we have some prairie on the land we own right behind our house, and uh, we did some burns, and it is really fun. Obviously, you need some training to do this, so don't light a fire this afternoon, please. But if you get some training, maybe you can help with it someday. It's fun work. Next slide. If you want to learn more about NRCS and pollinators, just do a search. NRCS and pollinators is a great website. Next slide. If you wanna to connect to the Xerces Society, that nonprofit I work for, we've got a Facebook page, a Twitter account, and Instagram. Next slide. 
we also have a YouTube channel for uh, you can learn lots and lots about bees and butterflies and other insects. Next slide. Whoop. Oh, uh, very good. An acknowledgement slide. I hope you can still hear me. My computer is telling me my connection is unstable. That might be the problem. Um, but yes, I want to thank our Very good. Uh, we are supported by uh, members and by, by a variety of uh, organizations and corporations. Um, and uh, next slide. Thank you very much for listening to this. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at ray.morans at usda.gov. And I believe that was 10 minutes. That was 10 minutes. Uh, Horace, if we need to move on, let's move on. If you feel we have time for me to load up a 25 second video, let me know. Uh, go ahead and do it. If you can get it. Get it <laughs> okay, let's give it a shot. I'm gonna share my screen right now. I'm sharing and I'm choosing the video. Do you see a vertical video clip? Yes, we do. Okay, now here to print, hit play, hit play, 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 play. <laughs> there we go. Do you see the butterflies flying around? We do. It's moving a little slow. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I've, I've been told videos don't always work great online. This place is absolutely spectacular. There were, uh, this is just a few thousand butterflies that you see, but there were millions and millions of them there that day. Right. Thanks for letting me show that. Um, please uh, go ahead and take control back uh, of the screen. I'll stop sharing is what I'll do. Stop sharing, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Morantz. Uh, great presentation. I actually got a chance to go to um, Costa Rica and uh, on, a, on a study abroad, and it was, it was very awesome to hear them talk about the, the, the butterflies. So thank you so mm -hmm. much. It's a great, great, great presentation. Thank you. Moving right along, um, we now are going to hear a story from Madeline Sarah, extension agent. Madeline has been an extension agent for 4-H and youth development in El Paso County through the Cooperative Extension Program, Prairie View Adam University for four years. She has also served as a volleyball coach with the El Paso Diggers for six years. Ms. Sarah has an undergraduate degree in occupational safety and health from Southeastern Oklahoma State University and is currently uh, completing a Master of Business Administration at Prairie View a &M University. Madeline, let us hear your story. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be doing this presentation. I am gonna present you over a day in the life of a county extension agent. Like Cora said, I am Madeline Seta. I am the uh, extension agent um, here in the El Paso County. If you could just scroll down a little bit. My presentation is kind of different from a PowerPoint. Um, so I work for Prairie View A&M University, best university. I am actually graduating this week with a master's in business administration from there. So woohoo, go Panthers, super duper excited, um, super blessed to have been able to get on with this organization, love all my coworkers. That's actually probably the coolest thing about my job is the people I work with. Um, they just make things so much easier and fun, that fun, you know, anything you guys do, it, whatever job you're in, just make sure you're having fun and you're waking up every day, wanting to do your job and having a good time. Okay. Um, like Forrest mentioned also, I am a volleyball coach. I run a club here in the El Paso, in El Paso, Texas. My mom is actually the owner, but I oversee all those things outside, outside of being a 4-H agent. That's what I do on the side is just overseeing the coaches, making sure the teams are well put together, training our youth, things like that. Um, I've always been around youth development. My grandmother and my mother have been educators. So I've always seen them, you know, um, impact lives and really try to grow our youth into leaders and just giving them positive 
positive guidance. Um, so the, they're, they're the ones that kind of influenced me to go into youth development when I was older. When I first went into college, well, let me back up a little bit. So I've always been an athlete. I got a full rise scholarship to play volleyball at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. So I was a student athlete. And um, I've always just been around youth development, even when I was young on teams. My mom coached a, a lot of teams. My grandma was a PE coach. My mom was a teacher. So um, that's always been in the back of my mind. And that was my side job in college also was coaching volleyball teams. So what I went to college to actually be a doctor, but then I switched my degree because I was like, you know what, that's just not for me. You know, I I can't be stuck in hospitals. I just want to do something where I can go back home and get back to the community. So I got a degree in bachelor's in science and then I came back home and decided to um, really scale our club. And then a position at Prairie View came along as a 4-H agent and things just took off from there. And it's just been a great journey. If we could just scroll down a bit, please. Now here's a map. If you can zoom out of the map a little bit, press the negative at the bottom. You can see Texas is kind of big. Keep pressing it a little bit so we can see Texas. Right, okay, so you see El Paso is right there on the border of Mexico and, and, and Texas. We're right there at the tip of the West. You know, I, I can literally throw a rock and hit Mexico right there. So that that's pretty cool. I go to Mexico all the time. It's pretty safe out there. I go get tacos. I go hang out. It, it, it's a great vibe. So it's not, it's not scary at all. If we could scroll down a bit, that's where I am from. Um, right there, you'll see a picture of our volunteer of the year this year for the El Paso County. Super great guy. Um, I do a lot of programs with him and you'll see later on in our presentation that volunteers are very involved in our youth development programs. Okay, the coolest experience I've had in my position, I would say are our youth labs we have um, every year at Prairie View A&M. Um, so I live in El Paso and then our headquarters is Houston and our youth lab is usually held at Prairie View A&M. It's about a 10 hour drive to Houston. So the way we accommodated our youth um, was we purchased them tickets. You know, uh, the extension office was able to um, get monies to able to fly five youth from El Paso, Texas to Houston. And that was a great experience for the youth because the target youth that we have is underserved youth. And this was most of them. Yes, most of them. It was their first experience flying. And they were just so taken away, so amazed. Their parents were so grateful. And at the end of the day, that's why we do it. We want to give these youth experiences where they can be like, you know what, I can do this. I, I, I can achieve these things. I can go places. I, I, can, I can grow where I'm at, you know? So, and then giving the opportunities to the parents, they're just so grateful at the end of the day. Some of them cry. It's just beautiful. It, it's great. Um, so the youth go through all these types of youth labs. I've taken, I believe, 10 youth through, um, through the years I've been to youth lab, only because I'm only allowed five since we, we fly out there. And then this past year, we had uh, a virtual one. So year one was reaching for the stars. If you could scroll down a little bit. Um, some of the main points we, we hit was we did a college tour of Texas A&M at Corpus Christi and of course Prairie View A&M. The kids are housed at Prairie View A&M so they have kind of like a college experience as to what the dorm like is like, what the cafeteria is like. So that that is super cool for them. They also do a lot of activities within those three days and, and the main cool activities that we did that one year was we visited the NASA museum and then we also visited the Texas A&M aerospace department tour where they showed them where um, the astronauts do in space you know how to make ice cream in space all that cool stuff and the kids were really excited if we could scroll down to year two please year two was mainly about water education um, of course, there was a lot of activities dealing with water conservation, um, the scarcity of water here. Um, and then our visiting, we did Moody Gardens. Super cool experience. I, and I'm talking about my experience, okay? I, I was just, I'm like a kid, you know, I'm, I'm, I was young at that time. So I, I've never been to these types of things. So to see this, it was just awesome. And then the youth were just like, this is so cool. And then, of course, we took a Prairie View a tour. 
So we could scroll down to year three. Year three um, was our virtual program last year because of the coronavirus and all that stuff. And it was based on college career readiness. It was, I thought it was great because we got to mail out all the kids that participated and we got to have a larger scale of, of kids to participate. We sent them all virtual goggles. So they were doing virtual reality things the whole entire time. And then we also had Travis Scott's chef um, from his restaurant in Houston come and give us cooking lessons. They showed them how to make chocolate chip cookies. The kids were super excited about that specific part just because of the whole Travis Scott thing, you know? So um, I thought that was, I was actually really excited. He's one of my favorite artists. So that was pretty cool for me too. Um, yeah, so Youth Lab. And then the main thing about why I specifically like Youth Lab is because I get to meet up with all the agents in the state. You know, um, I like collaborating with all my coworkers the rest of the agents um, throughout the counties for Prairie View a and I, I enjoy gathering and collaborating with them and building programs with them. So it's really cool to see them in person every once in a while since I'm so far out west compared to everybody else. If we can scroll. Um, so 4-H agent, basically in youth development, we, we surround ourselves with 4-H clubs, you know. I'm not gonna get into depth about what 4-H clubs are, are, are about, but I have currently four 4-H clubs, um, the Stallions, Eagles, Cubs, and Living Ventures. Each club participates in all different types of projects. Um, the Stallion Club is more of the coding STEM um, projects that they deal with and though uh, very great club. Our club manager is very involved in the community, great leader, um, just great club overall. The Eagles, they're involved in all sorts of projects. So they're involved in egg to chick, they're involved in youth entrepreneurship, they're involved in STEM programs, all that good stuff. And honestly, um, I start off, off these clubs, I find good volunteers, good club managers, and it kind of just takes off, you know? And it, it, it's great to see how many people in the community, how many adults wanna build our future. The Cubs is our little Clover Club and they're they're the babies, you know? So we do a lot of that small activities with them like gardening, planting, um, some coding in there with them, but we just try to keep them active, you know, just having a good time. Living Ventures Club is our specific youth entrepreneurship club who I team up with my CED agent here in the county. Her name is Andy Everett. She works for Prairie View also. And her and I team up with that club just to create businesses for kids. You know, if they're interested in being an entrepreneurship when they're older, you know, we teach them avenues of how to do that. We bring in other businesses to come in to talk to them. And then we also do about a shark tank kind of thing. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, if we could scroll, please. And then there's a short video, but I'm not sure of our Living Ventures Club. I'm not sure if you'll get, you guys will be able to hear the volume, but um we can just keep scrolling. Yeah. So these are a couple of photos of all our programs that we have that I implement here in the county. The first photo starting from the left um, is our Heroes for Health program, and that's our nutrition aspect. And we have about eight ambassadors that, that participate in that. And I teach them the nutrition lessons, and they go out into the community and they teach them. This lesson is specifically on the reservation. Um, in El Paso, we have the Isleta del Sopervo Dale Sir Pueblo, um, located here in El Paso, and we do a lot of programs with them. So that is one of them. They're teaching how to make sushi. There's about three pictures on there. And then the ones that are virtual is our programs for agriculture innovation experience. So this is where we hit our agriculture um, aspect. Um, it's a curbing our carbon appetite curriculum. And they just, I also have ambassadors that teach that lessons to the kids here in the community. Um, and that program is going great, that they're doing a great job. Kids are really excited about that. And then we have our athletes for computer science. We also um, hold state competitions for coders. And I think that's, that's awesome, people love it. And then we also have our kids, cows and more um, annual program that we have here every year in El Paso. We can scroll please. Some of the programs that I've already discussed, keep scrolling please. I'll, and then, um, our main partners here in El Paso are Socorro Independent School Districts, the Tigua Indians, like I said, the Isleta del Sur Pueblo Reservation, and then the AmeriCorps Vistas, and also the homeschools. I deal a lot with the homeschoolers here. If we could keep scrolling. 
What does a typical week look like for me? A bunch of programming and prepping for programs. That's that's kind of our my core thing, time management and just planning, planning, planning. I try to average about three programs per week meeting with my youth. And then I also meet with my 4-H clubs on a weekly basis, also with my club managers and my volunteers. I probably talk to my volunteers a good 50 times a week. It, it, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. It's it's crazy to know how excited they are to you know, give us their free time to help these youth grow. Um, I speak to stakeholders, legislate, legislators, and I hold committee meetings with all my PACs, you know, uh, different people here in the El Paso County that contribute to my programs. We are constantly planning for the next thing that we want to give the youth. So that that's, that's kind of the net. And then marketing and reporting. Oof, I do a lot of reporting, a lot, a lot of reporting, you know, through different avenues and it, it, we have to record all the numbers, all the targeted audience that we hit because we have to meet our certain you know, goals at the end of the year and then um, just require grant expectations that we have. My favorite part of the job is just growing the youth, you know, giving them leadership skills, you know, helping them grow in their projects and providing guidance. You know, I, I there's a lot of youth here in El Paso that don't know that they can scale out of El Paso. They don't know that they're able to go and travel or move out of here or have different experiences, you know. So that is one of the things I came back um, to El Paso to do because I was one of the very few that was able to get out of here from my grade and go play college volleyball. And you don't necessarily have to be an athlete to get out of El Paso. You know, there are a lot of great things. You could be an engineer. You could be coding. You can be involved in STEM education all those types of things. So those are the, some of the things that I want to, I want the youth to know. So they just have it in the back of their pocket, you know, just in case anybody wants to get out. And if I at least impact one youth throughout my programs, that's a win for me. And then at the end of the day, I just enjoy working with my colleagues. You know, I, my program leader, she's very encouraging. Um, my specialist, she's pretty amazing. And all the agents, we all help each other out. It's a team effort. So together we build tomorrow. That's kind of my slogan for us. So, and then my favorite impact story is I was able to provide through the Heroes for Health grant program. I was able to provide a Christmas um, day meal to a low income family. And it was just one of the most beautiful experiences I had. They were so grateful for everything that was provided. We provided them with a bunch of food, a bunch of pans, all kinds of supplies for them to cook up a great Christmas dinner. Um, so that's about it for me. I think I kind of went over time. So if you guys have any questions, write them in the chat. I'll, I'll answer them. And thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. I, I, I knew that being a county agent was just, just an awesome and certainly uh, community engaging. And we just want to thank you, Madeline, for, for sharing your story. But more importantly, we want to thank you for sharing your passion, because it is very apparent that you love what you do. And that's always important as you choose a career path. So thank you so, so much for, for sharing that story. Thank you. Well, OK, we're moving right along. I just want to remind everyone that uh, if you do have questions, uh, I'll put them in the chat box and uh, we'll get those answered. And I also want to thank the, 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 the participants on the call that are, are attempting to answer those questions in the chat box as we move along. So real appreciative of that, including my uh, other liaison officers, uh, partners, and uh, just, just thank you so much for being uh, a participant and being a team player. We, we, can't, we can't overemphasize that. Uh, and that's, that's part of the USDA family. That's an attribute of the USDA family and, and our partners. So thank you very much for that. Our next speaker. Wow, is a banker. Oh my goodness, I know her. <laughs> Monica Pierre is a senior USDA submission coordinator with Live Oak Bank. Prior to joining Live Oak Bank, she worked with USDA Rural Development in Texas for 23 years. She also worked in my office as a student assistant. Ms. Pierre is a second generation Purdue A&M University graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Economics. She resides in Crockett, Texas, where she works remotely for Live Oak Bank, providing financing options to rural communities across America and the U.S. territories. Monica, my student, my friend, take it away. 
Good morning. Thank you so much for having me this morning and being able to present to you careers in agriculture. Um, I'd like to start off with Dr. Seuss's book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. When you think about agriculture, you think, oh, I'm not looking to be a farmer. That was definitely my first thought when my dad brought it to my attention. As a graduate from Crockett High School, my goals and aspirations were to attend Texas A&M and to become a business major. However, up the road was Prairie View A&M, the alma mater of both my mother and my father. And they said, let's take a ride down here and let's check it out. Upon going to Prairie View, I was able to meet several of my, my dad's uh, counterparts and professors from back in the day, uh, Dr. Parks, Dr. Weatherspoon, Dr. Stanley and Dr. Rish, who I believe is still uh, teaching there at Prairie View, had been there with my father as well as Mr. Hodge and had given me a grand tour of the college and all of the possibilities that agriculture could take me to in my future. Uh, and, and of course, I was a member of the Prairie View Marching Storm. So that was another great thumbs up to be a member of the band uh, in going to Prairie View. And taking a career path in agriculture has been the best thing that I could imagine for my life, for my family, for the future. I've worked with several different entities under the USDA structure, um, but I have to first stop and thank Horace Hodge because he had given me, again, the opportunity to not only work in his office, but to have the opportunity to have four different terms working as a summer intern. In those internships, I had the opportunity to work with the Farm Service Agency for two years, where I was providing services to farmers through farm loans, beginner farmer and rancher loans, livestock insurance and crop insurance. I did that for two years, one summer in Crockett, where I resided at home and was able to go into the local office. The next year, I was able to do so in the state office, which is located in College Station, Texas, and that was a great opportunity as well. The following summer, Mr. Hodge was able to help me obtain a summer intern with DuPont Chemicals, where I was able to do agricultural research on chemicals for cotton production. So in that particular summer intern, I was able to take different crops, crop sizes and test different types of chemicals to ensure that we were able to, um, I'm sorry, Ray, maybe kind of take care of the bugs <laughs> and ensure higher productivity of cotton plants. Don't, don't get on me about that, Ray, we'll talk later. <laughs> the following year, I was able to uh, obtain a, an internship with Farmers Home Administration, which is now called Rural Development. Rural Development was a very wide range um, agency where I was able to assist rural communities and their families to obtain home loans, working with multifamily uh, apartment complexes, working with co community facility loans, which helped to facilitate police stations and fire stations, schools, and community centers for rural communities. I assisted with business and industry loans, where I would help to uh, give funding to expand current businesses or to assist in startup businesses for rural communities. And then my greatest passion was working with water and environmental programs. Who would think all of this comes from agriculture? Under the water and environmental programs, I was able to assist cities to expand and upgrade their water and wastewater treatment facilities. So when you go to turn on the faucets at home to get, get a glass of water or to wash those dishes that mom and dad is telling you to wash, I was very, I was helpful in helping those cities ensure that they had high quality water to ensure that things were clean and accessible to the communities. And as cities start to grow and more people come to smaller communities and they expand those small water lines that were able to filter water through to those small communities now need to be upgraded. And so larger water lines are needed so that more families can enjoy the, the great clean water of those communities. And I assisted those cities in providing them funding in order to pay the contractors and pay the suppliers to change out those water lines. So after my 23 year span with USDA, I had the opportunity to take those skills and leave and go out into the private sector or into the banking system. And there at the bank, I provide the same services I did through the government, um, through the bank. 
those programs were set up with the bank to ensure that the USDA or the government still had money for other programs and the banks helped with programs such as what I am funding now. So it was a way to, to leverage or spread out the funding so that we could still have other government funds to assist with other government programs. Um, my bank is located in North Carolina and they were nice enough to let me stay in Texas and work from home. So for the past three years, I have been working from my home where I facilitate loans throughout America, including the US territories and our bank has a private jet. So I'm able to fly across the country to assist in areas that I'm not able to get to in my vehicle and to give them the same services that they have in larger cities. I'm very, very happy that I chose the path that I did in agriculture. And once again, coming from a small community, I thought agriculture was all about raising animals. I just thought I'd be outside all the time in heat and in boots, but that's not the case. I get to dress up and put on my suits and heels and attend awesome meetings in person and take wonderful trips to assist individuals uh, with their future plans and expanding the communities. Um, I think that I've been very impactful to my children as I have two, two uh, college students now, both at Prairie View a and University. One is an ag business major, uh, Robert Lewis, and he is actually working with the Ag Research Center there on campus where he is doing test studies on um, industrial cannabis and its effect on the shelf life of food. So who, who would have thought that my son would have followed my, my path as I followed my dad's path, both in Prairie View and in agriculture. Um, and as you think about your careers and your future, one thing we always like to think about is where the money resides. Your income is, you can have a very great income in the field of agriculture. And starting out, when I first graduated, um, I was able to secure a, around a GS7 position with the US government. And around that time, I'd say it was in the 30,000 uh, 30, income range. I believe now it's in the 40s to 50s. Well, now that I'm working with the bank, I've been able to secure a six-figure salary uh, with great benefits, insurance, and stock. So those are great things to think about for your future as you plan out and think about how agriculture rules the world, runs the world, and oh, the places you will go. Horace, I want to thank you and your staff for allowing me to speak today. And I'm hopeful that if there's any questions or concerns in reference to banking and how a degree in agriculture could help to prolong that, I'd be more than happy to assist with that. But thank you, thank you, thank you, Monica. I, 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 be, to be honest with you, just hearing you talk almost made me tear up there. Uh, and particularly uh, the point that you made about the places that you will go. And also the, the point that you made about having your, your son to, to follow in your footsteps. I have three daughters and I, I say I got it right on the third try because she actually came to Prairie View, majored in agriculture, and now she's working for USDA. So, uh, and if you would have talked to her mom, that probably would have never, ever happened. I, I'm thinking about being out in the heat, being out in the elements and whatsoever. So thank you, thank you so much. And I, I'll end my phrase with you is saying, you can show them the money. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, moving right along. Uh, as we all know, uh, nutrition is important. Our next presenter will discuss a career in nutrition. As we all know, good nutrition is vitally important to our health. Dr. Torres Gonzalez is Vice President of Nutrition Research at the National Dairy Council. At the National Dairy Council, he serves as the subject matter expert on whole fat dairy foods, cardiometabolic health, milk fat ingredients, inflammation and cognition. His main role is to strategically define, develop and manage the research needed to build our scientific understanding about the role that dairy, whole fat dairy food, as well as milk fat ingredients play on cardiometabolic health, inflammation and cognition. Advancing the science on these areas will ultimately help better understand potential benefits of dairy and whole fat foods, 
in dietary recommendation and stimulate product innovation. He earned his bachelor's degree in biochemical engineering with a major in biotechnology and food science at the Institute of Technology in Colima, Mexico. He later obtained a master's degree in biochemical engineering at the Institute of Technology in Veracruz, Mexico. He also earned an additional master's degree as well as a doctoral degree in nutritional science at the University of Connecticut, USA. Take it away, Dr. Gonzalez, it's your time. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I mean, I have heard the, the stories of the previous speakers, great. Uh, uh, and also when I got the invitation from Ruby uh, about this summit, then I was thinking back, looking back of my own personal story. And I just realized that everything I have done in general I have, has been connected with agriculture. And let me just share with, with you part of my personal story and also part of my professional uh, story. Now, why I'm saying that all the work that I in some way have been doing since I was a kid is connected with agriculture. Uh, one of my first job that I had, it was when I was six years old and it, it, I was basically helping my dad. My dad, uh, at the time he was working in a dairy farm. Uh, he was a milker. Basically I was helping him to milk the cows, bare hands. And since then, uh, from six years to 12 years, uh, all the work, all the jobs that my dad was doing, um, it was related with the, with the agriculture, with farm, uh, either cornfields or again, uh, in a dairy farm. So interestingly, uh, I, since I was a kid, one of my dreams was to be a scientist and also to travel. And why I'm saying this? Well, a scientist at the time when I was a kid, I really didn't know what exactly I want to, to do as a scientist. But later on when I was in high school, um, I started developing this curiosity to understand better uh, our foods and how different components in, in the foods can impact health. And specifically, I got really, really interested in studying fat. Because, well, you know, uh, we normally perceive fat as a source of energy, but uh, it was after I watched a movie that I understand that fat or fatty acids, if I want to be more technical, could have an impact on human health beyond just providing energy, can regulate gene expression, can regulate liver function, heart function, brain function. And then is when I got really, got really interested. And also it was the first time in high school when I heard the word biochemistry. So I remember that I went to talk to my professor and I asked him that I already, already knew what I want to, to do for, for a career. And I say, I want to study biochemistry. So he advised me to do a kind of, uh, to go uh, to get a degree on um, biochemistry engineer because he was actually a biochemistry engineer as well. So I did my bachelor degree in, in biochemistry engineer. I would say with major in food sciences, because again, I want to understand uh, food production, how I, I, I want to understand how different foods can impact at the end of the day health. And after completing my, my uh, uh, bachelor degree, I also uh, pursue, as, I, as it was mentioned at the beginning, uh, a master's degree in, in biochemistry engineering, because again, I would just want to have better, better understanding of how foods are, are produced, all the different ingredients that are part of the food. But later on, I just realized that I might have been missing something because yes, I was able to, to make a food products and mostly most of these uh, uh, ingredients I was using, they could come from the agriculture production, right? So, uh, then is when I was advised by my mentor, by my master's to have a degree in nutrition sciences. And is when I came to the US to pursue a, a master's and then later on a, a PhD in nutrition sciences. Again, just to have a now better complete picture of the impact of diet, nutrients and overall diet in human health. And I specialized uh, during my PhD on cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes and obesity big real problems, not only here in the US, but worldwide. So after completing my, my uh, PhD, I had uh, two uh, research positions, one at Oregon State and the other uh, University of California, specifically at the, at the School of Medicine, because I want again to be more, uh, to have better understanding and going deeper, especially on how 
different fats and different fatty acids can impact and regulate different organs, different tissues in their bodies. So, but after, after a few years there is when I found this offer in my current position at the National Dairy Council, where they were looking for an expert in fat metabolism and also that could help to build the scientific evidence around the impact of dairy foods, especially dairy fats, uh, in human health with focus on cardiovascular disease. So I said, well, you know, this is what I what I uh, been doing. This is my my passion, uh, the passion that I developed when I was in high school to understand better fat metabolism, to understand better how fat in foods and different foods can impact differently uh, uh, health. And more importantly, that my work could help to provide more guidance uh, to, at the end of the day, to improve our dietary recommendations. We know that uh, diet plays an important role in reducing or uh, increasing the risk of different diseases. So at the end of the day, you know, my, my role as it was described, it just to define the research uh, strategies needed to continue building the scientific support that not only can have to can help understand better uh, the role of dairy foods in diet, but also in general or diet in different lifestyles with, with the risk of different diseases. My passion, my passion is again to continue learning, to continue have a better understanding or, or, or different diets or different fats and how this could impact uh, human health. Um, find it the, the one of the fun parts of my work is that I continue maintain my curiosity since I was a kid. I mean, I continue learning, learning, learning. Uh, the opportunity that this work has given me to interact with people across the globe. So I, I have been able to meet people from different cultures, also to travel a, a, a around the world. And I mentioned this because as I, uh, as I said earlier, one of my dreams when I was a kid is to travel. And the fact that I'm, my job has given me the opportunity to do so is like a perfect dream, it's like the dream came true. So at the end of the day, looking back at all the work that I have been doing, as I mentioned before, is all connected with agriculture. I mean, foods come from farms, different type of farms. And at the end, we as a, a different professions are able to kind of provide or different uh, uh, or no, to provide our knowledge to improve, to improve at the end of the day, uh, uh, human health, because we are providing by different means, uh, uh, better alternatives to improve also the life in, in agriculture. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Uh, I, I hope that uh, if anyone has questions, happy to, to answer. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. And, 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 and the point that I want to make from your presentation is, again, your passion, but also that if there are uh, participants that are seeking a very technical and a very targeted uh, type of work, uh, then agriculture or uh, will pro we'll provide that opportunity for you. If you really like uh, doing the research and then uh, making that finding available to improve uh, the world and the life of people, then agriculture is a place for you to do that. So thank you so much for, for, for being with us here today. Moving right along. Now you're going to hear another story, and I, and I like the way the presenters are presenting it in a story format. I, that is very, uh, uh, you know, it keeps you right on the edge of your seat, and uh, I can't thank uh, all of the presenters enough for doing that. Our next story, though, comes from uh, Juana Rosa, and I titled your story, Juana, and I gave it this title, How a Migrant Worker Made Her Way to Public Service. Warner serves as the Public Partnership Coordinator for the National Partnership Office in Washington, D.C., where she is responsible for the Secure Rural School Program. The daughter of campesinos or farmers, Warner Rosa grew up in a small village in Mexico. Her family migrated to the United States as farm workers throughout California. She grew up packing oranges, grapes, peaches, lemons, and other fruits with her family and learn to love the land. Coming from a rural village in Mexico with only three classrooms, Juana recognized the value of education and as a child developed a passion for learning. She dreamt of one day being able to help the environment after seeing rivers polluted by pesticides and trash. 
Wanda's inspiration has been her parents and their perseverance inspired her to attain a higher education, which essentially paved the way for a job at USDA Forester. She has a BA in Latin American Studies from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's in Spanish and a master's in international relationships from the Fresno State University. What a journey, Varner. Thank you for sharing your story. It's your time. Thank you. Can you guys hear me well? We can hear you. Thank you. Well, it is, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, my name is Juana Rosas and I am a partnership coordinator with the National Partnership Office. And I would like to tell you a little bit about the Forest Service, but also how um, you know, my journey went and how, I, um, how I'm at, at the place that I am at. So can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, first of all, a lot of the people don't know much about the Forest Service, including myself. When I started, I just knew I saw Smokey Bear and I thought, what is that? And I wasn't quite sure what uh, the Forest Service was. So the Forest Service has lands all across the United States and including some islands like Hawaii and Puerto Rico. And as you can see, some of the um, demographics there that you can read and um, I just wanted to let you know that if you wanted to travel, if you wanted to be mobile and work in the most beautiful places, you have the Forest Service that has places all the way in Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Next slide. Uh, a lot of the times we don't understand uh, how the structure works. So in here you have the president and you have the different um, the different departments, you know, Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Defense, and Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Commerce. So we follow under the Secretary of Agriculture and under that there's the Forest Service. And under that there's the National Forest System and that's where I'm working. Um, I also wanna highlight that there's other different branches that you can actually seek work as well. Next slide. Uh, there has been a lot of um, ideas about the Department of Agriculture, including my family. With my background in agriculture and farm working, my parents were like, why do you wanna work in the, in, in the dirt? What do you wanna work outside? We try to bring you to this uh, country to work and maybe being a lawyer, being uh, a, you know, a doctor, why do you wanna go back to, to, to the environment, to, to the fields? And I wanted to explain to them, and now I'm here to explain to everyone here and all the students that it's not just uh, you know, working in the fields, it's also working and having a career path. There's engineers, visitor information, ecologists, technicians, foresters, biologists, firefighting. There's so much in, in this uh, agency. And so I wanted to share that with you guys. Next slide, please. Uh, there's different uh, that you can identify here um, in permanent and temporary positions and all that through the Forest Service as well. And I will share uh, some slides or some information with um, the people that put this, this conference together so you guys can get some of that information on how to apply for jobs. So next slide. Okay, so, you know, I always seen this idea of like, why did I end up here? So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Let me tell you a story. And in Spanish, when you say yo cuento, it's a plate of words. You can say I matter, I tell my story. So let me tell you my story. I was brought up to the United States in 1995 after Mexican crisis in 94. My parents couldn't support us in Mexico and we couldn't, we couldn't you know, sustain our family there. So my parents decided to do the traveling to the US. I, I did cross the border when I was 13 and it was one of the experiences that now that I reflect back, it, it built my character, but it also helped me dream. Uh, one of, of the 
things that changed my life is working in the fields with my parents, getting up at five in the morning and realizing, you know what? I can do better. I know I can do better and I know I can I can do something that my parents are proud of. But I also had this love for being outside in nature and I wanted to figure out how can I mix both. So when I was in high school, I was lucky enough to come across a couple mentors, Jim Oftedell and also Trinidad Juarez, who signed me something that I didn't sign myself just yet. And no speaking, no English at that time. I, I felt that I was a little bit lost and a little discouraged because I didn't know how I was going to advance. Uh, my mentors real, realized that I had the potential. So they took me to a leadership camp and it was called Camp Smoky with the forest service so what i learned there was that it doesn't matter how you communicate as long as you have the passion and the willingness to do better the willingness to to say you know what i really matter and i want to make a difference in my community whether it's here in the united states or in mexico and so what i did is i took that job um and i i got so excited and i said you know what i'm gonna do my best and I, I, I pushed together and went through college. I was able to attend uh, UC Berkeley. And while I was there, the Forest Service gave me the opportunity to apply for this uh, internship in Washington, DC. And I was able to work with the civil rights department there. And you know, for me, it was kind of like a surreal idea of being this, this girl, you know, um, migrating to the US and, and being able to be, you know, in Washington, D.C., and being able to visit places that I only dream of, such as the White House, and also even going to the NASA uh, in, in a conference. So those are some of the dreams that I accomplished from, from farm working, right, from where I was born and also when, when I was uh, traveling here to the U.S. as a farm worker. Next slide, please. You know, something that inspired me was um, the power to have the opportunity to tell my story, but also share that, that platform for other stories to come up. And one of the most, you know, accomplished feeling that I had was working with youth. So um, my first job, permanent job with the Forest Service was um, being the Generation Green Coordinator in California for about 10 years. I was able to reach out to uh, at least, you know, a thousand youth. And one of the biggest dream was for them to have the same opportunity I had to explore my dreams and my potential. And some of them were so excited to just get an opportunity to leave uh, the fields, you know, I work with the farm working community of Orange Cove and Ridley, California, and all of them really, you know, and enjoy their honoring and decent job that their parents make, but they also had the, the aspirations to be bigger. So Generation Green and, and with the Forest Service gave the opportunity for these young people, not only to learn about natural resources and Forest Service, but also to see their potential. Some of the things we did is uh, empower them to public speak, empower them to do activities in their community, such as helping their abuelitos, their grandpas, and relating that to, to the environment. And I, I was able to serve with them for 10 years and I was able to see transformation of communities, not only to learning the skills, but also being able to, to be employed by the Forest Service. I have a family that um, all children follow the Forest Service in that sense. Uh, they became firefighters. Um, some are in hotshot crews where they're deployed it, you know, to different fires around California now that we have so many fires. Also, we had people that went into accounting and became budget officers. Some people that became partnership coordinators just like me and other people that decided they wanted to be wildlife, um, wildlife people and, and survey owls and do different things. So those are some of the career impacts that impacted my life. I, I feel that, you know, the best 
a reward I have is having them actually succeed and seeing my community actually, you know, evolve and, and enjoy what nature is and also enjoy having a career um, related to natural resources and agriculture. Um, after that, I decided that I wanted to, you know, seek out my dream of working and, and trying to help in Latin America in some kind of way. Maybe not going back to my hometown, uh, but I, I saw the opportunity to become the partnership coordinator in Puerto Rico. And I was so excited to travel over there. My mom was not too excited because she said, what are you doing? You've never been out there. You know, we just barely settled here in California. Are you sure you're gonna travel all across the US and cross the ocean and, and go over there? And I said, yes, mom, I'm, I'm sure that that's, when I, that's what I wanna do. In Puerto Rico, I was able to serve um, the community and also young people. Um, I was able to build a program that uh, was able to help five students the first year. And the second year, I was able to grow it to 15 students. And the program was to expose them to careers in agriculture, but also give them access to their public lands, giving them access to the power of making decisions and inputting their, their opinions and, and um, you know, facilitating for their communities. In Puerto Rico, most of the people speak Spanish. So part of my work was to be able to translate um, from leadership from the forest to the communities, especially after Hurricane Maria, I was able to be there during that hurricane and also Hurricane Irma. And I just, you know, I still get goosebumps because I know that I made a difference that year. Um, I know that the Forest Service needed somebody to translate and relate the information to the community and so that they can um, help them and also the community needed somebody to relay information about their interests and their care for their forest. So after the hurricane, we didn't have no phones, no radio, no type of technology. So we had to do posters by hand. We had to go to the post office, different places, meeting places so that we can let the public know that we were gonna have a meeting, a community meeting to you know, inform them about the status of, of the forest, but also, um, informed that, that we were willing to hire locally during this emergency. And we were expecting a hundred people and we were able to see that people care and they were willing to be part of the transformation in their public lands. So we received about a thousand people. Some people were there even before the meeting started previous night because they wanted to make sure they were receiving the help they needed, but also they wanted to take a part of the recovery of the national forest. So that's a little bit of my experience there. Next slide. I think one of the biggest key points is when you are a public servant like I am, um, you really think about the community as your family. And I think when you think about your family, you want your family to be successful. And I think by sharing what we know about agriculture, by sharing all the tools and, and by sharing the opportunity, it gives people empowerment. It also uh, helps us live a very good heritage, but also very good inheritance to our children's and next generations. Um, I think for me, this job has changed my life just because I'm able to do something I love, but I, it also makes me feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives and in, in my communities. Um, and I, I just wanted to say thank you for having me here. And I know the young people are the future. And I know that um, like you can see in this picture, those all are young people that now are being able to dream and live the dream. And I think uh, it's very important to realize that sometimes would you just have to give people an opportunity. And I think the Forest Service and the Department of Agriculture has a lot of opportunities out there. And I think uh, as a student, just take the chance, look for people, look for mentors, reach out, uh, try to figure out how to get your foot on the door. And I know that a lot of 
uh, my community, especially being one of the persons migrating to this country, there's a lot of, of great talent, great people that maybe no, don't have necessarily documents uh, to work, you know, um, full term and with the, with the federal government, but there's other avenues. And I think um, I'm reaching out to, to, those, to those students to keep dreaming, to not give up, especially those dreamers that have the opportunity to make a difference. So uh, I think there's opportunities with the Department of Agriculture and our partners that can help you uh, achieve some of your dreams. And um, I will leave you with that. I know I ran through a lot of information and I wish I had more time to give you more tools, but in here you can see the websites where you can find out more about how to work with us, how to work with the Forest Service, um, opportunities for young people. And, um, you know, I don't know if the presenters uh, previously and also the organizers can give us, can give out my information if anybody wants to reach out and have questions. Um, so thank you very much for having me and um, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Wow. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It is just so reinvigorating to hear these, hear these stories and, and, and feel the passion from, from our presenters. Thank you so much, uh, Juana. Great, great story. Uh, great, great accomplishment. Keep up the great work. Now, we're gonna have some cool stuff uh, that we want to show you. Technology at work. And it's gonna be presented by Dr. Dan Martin. Dr. Dan Martin is a research engineer with USDA Agriculture Research Service Aerial Application Technology Research Unit in College Station, Texas. He has over 30 years of training and experience in biological and agricultural engineering and has specialized in aerial spray application technologies for precision agriculture and pest management since 1994. He has authored and co-authored over 40 uh, referee journal articles and has given over 100 technical presentation at regional, national, and international forums, including more than a dozen invited presentations at professional conferences in five different countries. He has held various leadership positions in professional societies and is widely recognized as a leading authority in manned and unmanned aerial application system for precision agriculture. Cool stuff, Dr. Martin, you're on. Application Technology Research Unit. Today, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about who I am, how I got here and what I do. So a little bit about my background. Uh, so I grew up in 4-H from the time I could walk until the time I graduated high school, I was in 4-H doing all kinds of projects, gardening, photography, commodity marketing, citizenship, you name it, I was doing it in high school. And that provided really the foundation for my career. I then went on to study agricultural engineering at Virginia Tech and finished that up there and then did a master's and PhD at LSU. My master's was working with rice bran, looking at uh, additional ways that it could be used uh, in food, in people's food. And then also um, for my PhD, I worked on better ways to automate oyster shucking. So. I'm not sure what happened, Horace. It froze. Just give me a second. Horace, I think I'm having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is buffering. Yeah, the, it's the, the internet speed. I'm connected so, to the Wi-Fi at the university. It was working earlier. I know I played it. So can uh, can Martin come uh, live and talk?
Yeah, so Ruby, I can I can take over live. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick and I'll just, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go live. Hold on a second. Uh, yeah. Thank you. You, yeah. you. you can share your screen. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'm gonna switch over here. All right. Yeah, that's good. All right, I have lost my, hold on, it's, it's not, it's not showing me my, my part of it here now. Okay, can you all see that okay? Is everything good there? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we do see, see it, yeah. Okay, good, so my name is Dr. Dan Martin. I'm a research agricultural engineer for the United States Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service, Aerial Application Technology Research Unit. Wow, what a mouthful, right? But today I wanna to talk to you just a little bit about who I am, uh, my background and what I do and um, why it's still what I do. So my background, uh, I grew up in 4-H. My mom was actually our 4-H agent for our county. So I know we, uh, y'all heard a lot about 4-H yesterday and a little bit more about it today and the importance of it. It doesn't really matter too much whether it's 4-H or FFA, it's youth development. Being involved in some type of youth development organization is critical. So I actually grew up in Blacksburg, Virginia, where Virginia Tech is. And um, I always knew that uh, I like to be outside and I had a mechanical mindset. So I studied agricultural engineering while I was at Virginia Tech. Uh, that went really well. And I was invited to go down to LSU to work full time and then pursue a master's. And then ultimately a PhD while I was there. My master's work was looking at different ways to use rice bran uh, for human consumption. Um, and then for my PhD, uh, looking at better ways to automate oyster shucking, which is critically important for South Louisiana, you know, being right there on the Gulf Coast. So that's what I did. And then I started with USDA right after I finished my doctorate in 2003. So currently I'm a research agricultural engineer for USDA. Specifically, I work for the Aerial Application Technology Research Unit here in College Station, Texas. So, you know, with all the academic stuff behind us, so realize like for the academic part, stay in school, do a good job with your science and math classes, and you can do whatever you want. Uh, engineering opens up all kinds of opportunities um, to do all kinds of stuff. And so I want to share some of the coolest stuff that I do with you right now. So part of that, uh, I think the best way to do that is to share a study that I did out in New Mexico last summer with a group down in uh, the Rio Grande Valley called APHIS. Uh, it's an animal plant health inspection service. They asked me to work with them on a way to control grasshoppers in rangelands uh, using um, an aerial platform that I've recently started looking at over the last two or three years, and that is drones. So um, here's a little bit about that study out there, it's just barren. There's, there's nothing there. There's some wildlife, there's some cattle, but forage, you know, grass and food is, is very scarce. And so these grasshoppers uh, infest some of these areas, and especially last year, they were a huge nuisance. You can see how big this grasshopper is. And they, they eat about 20% of the forage. Like there's just not enough to eat out there already. And it takes 200 acres of land to support one cow. So uh, you can't afford to lose any of that land any more than you, than you have to. So we went out there to see if we could help control them with a, a spray drone, uh, just like they would with an ag aircraft. And so you can see the grasshoppers here. There's just a ton of them. Uh, anytime you have over about eight per square meter, uh, it's time to, con to, to do some kind of treatment to control them. Here you can see this is just on the road and there's about 30 of them just here in this square meter. So the th economic threshold is what they call it. Uh, it's actually when you need to uh, make a, a spray application or a control effort uh, is eight. So we were well above that in this area. So our objective really was to look at the viability of treating uh, for these grasshoppers uh, using a drone. And the first part of that is really looking at the drone, the way it's set up um, and being able to put out a, a granular uh, bait, and then also a spray application for this control. And then we had entomologists that work with USDA that would go out and see how well it actually worked over about two weeks period. 
they would go out and count all the insects each day and then do counts. And then we would track that over time. So I'll show you some of those results in this study. So here's the area, it's a rather large area. Each one of these little treatment blocks here is 10 acres in size. So the blue ones are where we put the granular bait. It looks like a catfish pellet, but it has um, uh, uh, an insecticide in it where if the uh, grasshoppers eat that, it will um, terminate them. The yellow parts are where we are untreated controls. So there are areas where we would count the grasshoppers, but we made no applications in those areas at all. And then the green squares that you can see there are where we put out a liquid spray application. So this, uh, the first part of it for engineering is really knowing what you're putting out. So we had to calibrate the system. This is the drone that I fly. It's a hexacopter, so six different rotors. And uh, we have a hopper underneath of it that has the granular bait, the insecticide bait. And what we're doing, we put it in a bucket there because otherwise it would throw it all over the place, right? We needed to capture the amount of what was being applied and then weigh it up and see exactly what we were putting out. So this is what's called calibration. Um, then I would take the drone and I, all those buckets, those white things out there, those are buckets, two gallon buckets. And I would take the drone and fly over those buckets, spreading the bait. And then we would go and weigh up the amount of material that's in each one of those buckets to see how much was being put out. And then also from that, we could create what's called a pattern, a spreader pattern that looks like this. Now it looks a little jank, right? There's a lot of ups and downs, but we're put down at a very low rate. It, from an environmental standpoint, we don't want to put out any more than we really have to. So these are like one or two pellets in each bucket. So it's, it's a lot of up and down. But, you know, when we look at the pattern for that, sorry, when we look at the pattern for that, uh, I could see that we, those red lines right there indicate how wide a swath I could uh, fly. And so it ends up being about 50 feet. Now, this is a little test showing uh, the, the bait coming out of the spreader just on the ground. When it's up in the air, there's so little amount that's coming out, it's really hard to see. But this is part of the, of the test is making sure everything is functioning correctly. Now, oops, I'm sorry, this, this goes on to, uh, anyways, I gotta, sh I gotta show you this. Um, so it's, let me see if I can uh, start this right here. I, I forgot it, it goes into more of the, um, the actual, um, let's, let's, let's just go through it. So what it actually shows is the application of this in the air over the, the target areas. So at first it's just showing what those pellets look like. And then we have a drone that's flying over top of my drone with a camera on it. And then it's showing you what that would look like from the air. So on this one in particular, the way that we had it all set up and what we figured out is that I could fly 10 miles an hour at 20 feet above the ground and get my application rate um, by flying what we call swaths every 50 feet based on that pattern test. So this is the, the amount, this is the material being put out. You can see it's just, there's very little of anything there, but it did a really good job of controlling the grasshoppers. So the next part of it was the spray application. So again, we have to do the calibration, measure everything all out. This is what the drone looks like. If you look here and you're not familiar too much with drones, this is the hopper down here. We have the batteries right above the hopper. All the electronics are contained in this blue box up here. These white things are called a GPS antennas. It tells us where we are and how fast we're going. Uh, and then here are the motors. These are what would you would call propellers if they were on an airplane, but with drones, we call them rotors because they spin horizontally, not vertically like uh, you would in an airplane. And then we have the arms right here and the landing gear. And then for a spray system, we have, these are called booms, they hold the nozzles. And then we have the nozzles, these orange tip uh, deals right down here are the nozzles that actually atomize the spray. So we had to do calibration on this again, measuring things out, looking at flow rate of the system, pressure, uh, droplet size, all that kind of stuff. And then what this is, is a, a video showing the pattern testing that we did for the liquid spray application. So bring the drone down to the height that we want to spray for this one, which is 10 feet off the ground. And then we had water sensitive papers that were on the ground uh, to show us where those droplets landed. So this is a picture of the water sensitive papers. You can see the droplets. We can run it through special software uh, with a computer that shows us how many droplets, the size of the droplets, droplet distribution, coverage, application rate, 
all kinds of data that we can collect from just these cards. The pattern looks like this, a little bit better than what the granule looked like. And then from that, we know what our application rate needs to be. And then from that, we can calculate what the swath is. For this one, it goes from negative six to seven meters. So that ends up being a total of 13 meters or about 40 feet. So that's what we're gonna fly. And this is what it looks like, first person view from the drone. So this is a GoPro that I hooked up to the drone. As an engineer, you get to work with all these kind of cool toys, okay? So we call them tools. My wife always likes to call them toys, right? But they're my tools. So a GoPro hooked up to the drone so that I can get this kind of footage from it. So on this application, I'm making a pass actually every 80 feet because from an environmental standpoint, um, they can make, we can make an application every, uh, at, four, at one position and then skip a swath. It's called skip swath because the grasshoppers move around and they can go to the areas that are treated. So we, we actually spray every 80 feet. I'm flying at 20 miles an hour at 10 feet off the ground uh, for these applications. And everything's pre-programmed, so it's autonomous, okay? Which means I program it, I tell it exactly where to go, what to do, what height, what speed, and it takes off and lands automatically. I did that whole thing, that whole 10 acres in five minutes because we were just putting out 16 ounces to the acre or about a gallon and a half of material over that whole 10 acres. And it was really fast and efficient. So these are, these are the lines, the spray lines and the spreader lines from the, the plots. But let me show you just a little bit of the, the results. Now this is a little confusing, right? Because there's so many different species of grasshoppers. Each one of these bars represents a different species that the entomologist had to go out and figure out, okay, it's this species and this is how many there are. That's why I'm an engineer, not an entomologist, because I, I just could, I couldn't handle that. But you can see there's two or three of them over here on this right-hand side that are bait-loving species. So only certain grasshoppers really like it. The other ones turn their nose up at it. So it didn't work too well overall. Now for the liquid application, um, these gray bars right here indicate where we put out the insecticide with the spray. And you can see the number started out close to 30 grasshoppers per square meter. And by the time we got down to two weeks, we only had five or six per square meter. So it worked really well and it was highly efficient. And that's all I have. So that's kind of a day in the life of a research agricultural engineer working for USDA. And it took a whole team of us to do that. But uh, it's it's a, a very interesting job, and I, I do different things all the time. So it's it's never boring. It's always exciting. And that's all I have. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you, Dr. Martin. And uh, just, just to know for people that are listening that, you know, precision agriculture, it, it's so important in where you have a profit margin loss because of the uh, application of, of those expensive chemicals. And we just need to get it right and get it precise. So, uh Agriculture engineers um, certainly has a space in, in, in USDA as well as in the private sector. Um, I was actually out on a field not long ago with a minority uh, landowner that was actually getting his uh, fence line and his, um, and his uh, lake sprayed uh, from, from a drone. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, we look forward to getting you down to Prairie View sometime. So thank Sounds you very, good. Very, very much. Yes, sir. Well. We are about uh, 10 minutes out, and uh, I don't know, Ruby, if we have uh, some questions in the, uh, in the chat box that has not been answered, but um, we got a few minutes to open it up. If there are any questions live, uh, we'll give you a minute or two. Anybody out there that might have a question for any of our presenters, anyone? No? Well, that only tells me, and we're going to get you out here early and get you out before noon, that our speakers did a wonderful job of telling their stories and presenting their career path. Horace, so, don't forget, we have one more presentation. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, we do. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much, Ruby, because this is really, 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 really important. And it gives um, a, an insight on you know, what, what are the career paths and then give you an idea of, of the uh, statistics associated with that career path. And we have a very, very um, knowledgeable presenter, um, Jasmine uh, Hernandez. 
Uh, Jasmine holds a BS in Rehabilitative Services from the University of Texas Pan America. She currently serves as a workforce outreach specialist at Workforce Solutions, the local workforce board which delivers services to the counties of Hidalgo, Starr, and Williston. In her position, she works with local school districts, colleges, and community partners by building and nurturing relationships that assist in empowering students to make successful, informed decisions about their future. She has over eight years in working with workforce development, specifically with the youth population. Jasmine, give us the statistics. I thank you very much, Mr. Hodge, for the introduction. So good morning, everyone. It's still morning. My name is Jasmine Hernandez, and I'm going to go over some labor market information for the careers in the agricultural world. So the neat thing about the agricultural world is that a lot of careers that fall into it come from other industries or career clusters. So we can go into the first slide. So what is labor market information? Labor market information can assist you in making better informed decisions about your future. And if we go ahead and click, they can come from narrowing down the location on where you wanna live after you graduate from college, what typical education is needed for that specific career or occupation, projected growth, and then the average wages or the medium wages. So the first one that we have here is agriculture engineers. So there's an average annual openings for agriculture engineers of eight. And then the Texas average earning is $43.59 an hour and annually is over $90,000 a year. The typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree. Now that is a typical entry level education, but keep in mind that the more education that you have, the better chances that you have in actually getting a position and actually getting paid more. When it comes to agriculture engineers at this moment, or actually in 2020, there was 130 positions available in the state of Texas. And in the United States, there's over 106, uh, over 1,600 positions available. When it comes to agricult agricultural and food scientists, there is an average opening, there's an average of 208 annual openings in the state of Texas. And the hourly average is $32.90 per hour. And annually, the average is over $60,000 a year. And the typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree. For agriculture and food scientists, currently in the state of Texas, there's 1,697 positions available. That will increase. There is a projection of an increase of over 200 jobs, close to 300 jobs for 2030. And there's over 35,000 jobs in the nation. So if you do not wanna stay in the state of Texas, there's more jobs available. And that is also going to increase in 2030 by over 2,000 jobs. For biologists, there is an average of 217 annual openings in the state of Texas. The average hourly wage is 4074 with a typical entry level education of a bachelor's degree. And on average, annually, they make over $84,000 a year, which is really good. For biologists, there's over 2,000 jobs in 2020 here in the state of Texas, and there is an increase of over, 200 and, over 285 jobs for 2030. In the nation, there's over 46,000 jobs right now in 2020, or actually during the year of 2020. And we will also see an increase of over 3,000 jobs for 2030 in the nation. For conservation, conservation scientists, there's an average of 200 openings in the state of Texas, and the average or hourly wage is 2921 with over $60,000 for the average annually. And again, the typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree. There's over 1,900 jobs in 2020 in the state of Texas. And in 2030, there's also gonna be an increase by over 150 jobs. And in the nation in 2030, we are going to see that there's gonna be over 26,000 jobs available for the United States. For dietitians and nutritionists, there is an average um, of 425 jobs here in the state of Texas opening, right? And there is their actual average earnings per hour is 2090, and their annual average earning is over $60,000 a year. Now, again, the typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree, but the, again, I'm going to stress it more. The more education that you have, the more that you are probably going to get paid. 
The typical on-the-job training for a dietitian or nutritionist is an internship or a residency. There's over 5,000 jobs, or there was over 5,000 jobs in 2020 in the state of Texas, with over 73,000 jobs in the nation. We are going to see an increase for both in Texas and the United States. For Texas, there's going to be an increase of over 800 jobs for 2030, and in the United States, by over 8,000 jobs. For an education outreach, also they can fall under, un, under education administrators. There is an average of 315 uh, job openings in the state of Texas with an average of 3780 for the average hourly earnings and over $78,000 per year. The typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree and they do prefer for you to have at least um, a couple of years of, of experience, but no more than five years to actually get into that position. And there is also going to be an increase in education outreach. In 2020, there was over 3,000 jobs available in the state of Texas and over 58,000 jobs in the nation. And we're going to see an increase for 2030 in Texas by over 700 jobs and over 6,000 jobs in the nation. For env environmental engineers, there is an average annual openings of 292 jobs in the state of Texas, which is a lot. It's really good for those that want to be engineers. And the average hourly earning is 52.05. With them annually, the average is over $108,000, which is a really, really great amount for the state of Texas. The typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree. And as we can see here, there's going to be an increase from 2020 to 2030 by over 500 jobs in the state of Texas and over 3,000 jobs in the nation. When it comes to food scientists and technologists, there is an average annual openings of 81. And on average, they make 36.15 an hour and the annual is over $75,000 a year. And their typical entry level education is a bachelor's degree. When it comes to food scientists and technologists, we are also going to see an increase right now or in 2020, there was 632 jobs available. In 2030, there's a projected increase of 134. And in the nation in 2020, there was 14,000 jobs, over 14,000 jobs available. And we are going to see that that's gonna increase in 2030 by over 1,100 jobs. When it comes to loan officers, um, this is gonna be one of the careers or occupations that we see a higher average annual openings. And that one has over 2,000 jobs. It's actually 2,127 jobs available for the state of Texas and their hourly average earnings are $39.59, and the annual may go, or the average is $82,201. Their typical education or their typical entry-level education is a bachelor's degree, and they do have a typical on-the-job training, which is moderate term on the job training, which means that once you get hired, they will train you right there. When it comes to loan officers in the state of Texas, there's over 24,000 jobs available, and we are going to see an increase in 2030 by over 2,000 jobs. In the nation, there's over 300,000 jobs available as loan officers, and we're also going to see an increase by over 16,000 jobs for 2030. For public relations specialists, the average annual openings for the state of Texas is 2,866. The Texas average hourly earnings is $29.43 uh, and annually is $61,214. And the typical entry level education for a PR specialist is a bachelor's degree. For public relations specialists in the state of Texas, there is 27,000 jobs available. And we are also going to see an increase by over 3,000 jobs. In the nation, there's over 272,000 jobs available or in 2020. And that is going to see, uh, we're actually going to see an increase by over 27,000 jobs for 2030. So all that information, we have it available on the Padlet. So if you have a cell phone, what you can do is that you can open your camera up and then hover it over the QR code that you see on the screen. And that's going to open up a link. If you do not have access to a cell phone, what I'm going to do is place the link on the chat. And all the information that I provided you is going to be located in the Padlet. Uh, if you kind of see on the screen, it's going to have the occupation. 
And then below that, it's going to have the occupation overview and then the occupation table. So the occupation table will have a lot more information than what I provided uh, for you guys today. And hopefully you learned a little bit of in regards to some of those careers. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to voice them out right now. Well, thank you so much, Jasmine. And certainly uh, that information is, is, is very valuable in, uh, in, in, in students that uh, want to pursue certain career paths. They can get an idea of what they can expect. Uh, you know, a lot of time when I know in college students and, and, and even just people in general, uh, when they think about a career or they interview for a job, they always kind of want to know what the salary range is. We always tell them not to ask that question, but this, this will give them some insight on what, what they can expect. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we're certainly going to keep in touch with you because as we look at, uh, you know, for the fall, uh, starting up the new school year, that this will be valuable information for us too. So thank you so much for sharing that information. And, um, and for really quickly, I will enter or I will actually add the presentation to the Padlet. So for those of you that did request a copy of the presentation, that will be included in the Padlet. Thank you, thank you so much. And just for a moment now, I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, uh, Ruby uh, De La Garza, as she has some information to share. Ruby. Thank you, Horace. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that our office also organizes a monthly seminar series um, where we feature a variety of um, individuals with different backgrounds, uh, mostly STEM, um, who work at our agencies. And so we do this on the third Wednesday of every month. Um, this month, um, we will be featuring two individuals from Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, we'll make sure to put that information in the link if you'd like to sign up. Um, it'll be next Wednesday at two o'clock. Thank you, Horace. Well, thank you, Ruby. And, and I really wanna thank you for this has been quite a journey for us planning this and having all of the, uh, uh, the planning committee. Can't thank them enough. Um, certainly uh, wanna thank all of our presenters. Awesome job on both yesterday and today. So I conclude with this. Uh, from day one, we hope you learn about opportunities in agriculture regarding special programs. And from today, the various pathways to careers in agriculture and related sciences. I want to thank everyone and please enjoy the rest of your day.